Well, I thank you most kindly for those words. I'm, I'm flattered, and I hope I can uh, begin to live up to them. I'm, uh, as far as teaching goes, you're never done. I'm working on it. I'm working on being better. So uh, we'll see if I do a little bit better here. I'm so happy to be here, too. I love Minnesota. I love um, the whole atmosphere. I love the area you're in, and I think you should be so proud of, of St. Olaf because it does a great job. And I'm so pleased that I was asked to contribute to this here tonight. What I want to talk about are the politics of the Constitution, where sort of where political theory and real politics meet the strategic concerns that the politicians who wrote it had. I wrote the book because as I looked at the different publications on the Constitution, I felt there's not really a good, objective account of the politics of the Constitution in the way I saw them play out as I read the records. And I reread the records, and I read the records again and again. It's a political event, and my theme here is pretty simple. Politicians wrote the Constitution for politicians to use, and that's what you see them doing now, and they've always done for the last couple of hundred years. Let me say that as a political analyst, when I talk about constitutions, I don't mean that as an insult. I don't mean it in a derogatory way. Okay, so there's bad politicians. We know that. We might differ in who they are, but uh, we uh, know that there are some politicians on both sides who are not very nice. But there are lots of people who I think pretty much represent us. We have some bad people too. There's also some really idealistic people who are out there to construct a better world. And there's a lot of people in between with a mix of good and bad. I refer to people who pursue the vocation of making government work from the inside as politicians. They could be good, they could be bad. Some are idealistic, I admire some on both sides. And some not so much. Understanding that the framers were politicians who, in this sense, were engaged in the work of a lifetime. What an opportunity this was for those young framers who were able to build a government, a new government from scratch in the middle of the Enlightenment. What an opportunity for them. And it was the political fight of their lives. That is not just rel you know, politics the way we think of it today. This is a noble activity. And I think of politics that way. So I think thinking of the framers as politicians doesn't diminish the framers. It ennobles them. So here are the six things I want to talk about. Who wrote this? What did James Madison, who really was the engine behind an awful lot that happened in Philadelphia that summer of 1787, what did he want? And what was he worried about? What dilemma did he confront? I want to talk about Roger Sherman that we're not very familiar with. He doesn't have statues in Washington. He has no memorial. He's not on any American currency. But he sure had a big impact on the Constitution. Now, talk about that. The Constitution was built by compromise, by negotiation, hey, by some of the things people use in politics now, not to mention sometimes in families. Maybe you'll recognize things like bargaining negotiation, evasion, delay, and ambiguous statements that paper over differences. And then I want to talk about what we inherit. So who wrote this Constitution? I love looking at the way we've depicted our Constitution over time. This is a popular image of the Constitution's authors. Uh, this is by uh, an artist named Howard Chandler Christie, very famous picture. Uh, done in 1940. It's in the United States Capitol. What I like about this, and you probably wouldn't know at first, is that Christie took portraits, individual portraits of different framers of the Constitution and stuck their heads on bodies that he painted. So 
This portrait of Madison gives him a kind of an unusually big head uh, for the body, and that's not um, completely accidental because he was sticking a different portrait on a body. But you can see that this is a constitutional convention that is dominated by the big guy, uh, as the Irish might call him, George Washington, that there's a lot of um, intellectual heft to this, and that people are pretty much polite and say nice things about each other and so on. Uh, this is another one that I like quite a bit. This is a um, painting that is above the Constitution itself in the United States National Archives. You may have seen this in person if you've seen the Constitution and the Declaration at the Archives. And this is my favorite. Here's George Washington looking for all the world like uh, a saint ascending into heaven, and in fact, he is ascending into heaven. And just to go back to this one, you can see some sainthood in Washington, even in this, with the long robes. We kind of treat the Constitution as American scripture and look at it as a source as much for aphorisms and for affirming the views we already have as for settling debate. All right, well, that's what we think the Constitution's authors were like sometimes. The reality is different. If you saw the movie Lincoln, you saw politicians at work, some really idealistic, some ready to make deals to get reelected, some just scared. They were real human politicians. They wrote the Constitution like the practical human politicians that people the movie Lincoln which I recommend to everyone. They were not saints. They were not angels sent from heaven. They were not philosophers, primarily. They were practical, vocational politicians. They were not plundering investors, which has an interpretation, which has a long history, going back to Charles Beard 100 years ago. And they were not, and I must say with some gratitude and relief, they were not political science professors. <laughs> These politicians, keep in mind, had nearly all served in their state legislatures. Remember, the American colonies filed for divorce from Britain. It was not a nice divorce, it was a nasty divorce. But in the process, these individuals who showed up in Philadelphia helped build a dozen republics, independent republics. They did the things that are hard for any government to do, which is to collect taxes from you, to provide for security, and that was not so easy with the English wandering around their land. They created legislatures, they created different kinds of public offices like governor. They helped build a dozen infant republics. They had nurtured these states, that's a significant word, state, like a nation state, like Stadt in German. They had natured their new Republican states through war and then a terrible depression where the GDP of the country fell as much as it did during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Most of the 39 signers went on to benefit from the Constitution, not economically the way Beard argued. They benefited politically. They almost all wound up in office in the government they created. 11 were elected to the House. State governments sent 15 to the Senate. Five served on the Supreme Court. Four ran for president. Two were elected and served two terms each. Both of those are on American currency. Washington, you may have in your wallet. None of us, I think, have uh, James Madison, who's on the $5,000 bill. Deep, bitter conflicts divided these politicians. They used all their skills, the skills they had learned in the hotbeds of Republican politics, the new states, with new legislatures, new groups of politicians lining up 
new factions lining up against them. They use their political skills the way we do, with bargaining, delay, evasion, deliberate ambiguity in their words. Conflict, negotiation, and compromise mark the Constitution from beginning to end. That's what produced the Constitution. So the framers wrote the Constitution as a rule book for future politicians to use. They expected future politicians to work out the decisions that they left for other generations to deal with, to work through the details. That, I think, is the real meaning of the Constitution. Let me tell you about their aspirations. I like talking about James Madison. I've become very fond of James Madison. Our shortest president, by the way, dear friend of Thomas Jefferson. This is how we remember James Madison today. The textbook I have used in American politics, previous version had this picture. And I like that picture. Here's the framer of the Constitution. And they have it in the Constitution chapter. That was James Madison in 1821. The Constitution, was written in 1787. This is that picture that we talked about a little bit earlier, and there's Madison in it, this picture. But in 1787, Madison was a much younger man, 36 years old. Hamilton, by the way, was 30. Madison, at the age of 36, looked a whole lot more like old blue eyes here. Young, shrewd, accomplished, and really quite ambitious. Like you would expect, a fairly privileged, young, aristocratic type guy to be at the age of 36 in the biggest state in the Union, Virginia. He was a successful young Republican politician, Republican with a small r believing in the principles of republicanism, that the people should rule. After 1787, note, did he quit politics to become a philosopher? Oh, no. He was not only elected to the House of Representatives after a political opponent dumped him in the opportunity to get a Senate seat. Instead, he ran for the House. He won. And then he got elected again and again. And he became the leader in the House of Representatives as he was one of the leaders in the Constitutional Convention. He co-founded the Democratic-Republican Party in the 1790s along with Thomas Jefferson. He served as Secretary of State when the United States bought Louisiana. And when the Jefferson administration, by not giving an appointment to a justice of the peace, set in motion the beginnings of the process of judicial review in Marbury versus Madison. He won two presidential elections. Let me put it this way. You think Bill Clinton is a consummate politician. This guy ran for office more than Clinton did. What did Madison want? He's a young guy. He has a vision of the nation, and if you've ever been to the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, you can imagine this. It's beautiful. And if you stand on Madison's porch, it feels like you can see the future forever because the Blue Ridge Mountains are in the west and over those mountains is who knows what, a whole lot of land for a United States to dominate. He wanted a strong and Republican national government that would fight for the interests of the United States, of America as a whole, in a world of tremendous opportunities for enriching America and threats from the great navies of the world, the British Navy, the French Navy, British troops by the time he was participating in the convention still had troops on American soil at Detroit. There were a whole lot of opportunities that he wanted to take advantage of with a strong government that had very broad powers. 
broader powers than you might think he would have supported. This guy was a political strategist, and he wrote letters to Jefferson, to Washington, to his state's governor, Edmund Randolph, laying out his strategy. Six steps. Try this at home. Know the facts. Be a know-it-all. This is a guy who studied, wanted to be ready, kind of um, compulsive about it, studying governments in ancient Greece, in Rome, in other parts of the ancient world when there was evidence for them. More contemporary governments like the Netherlands, uh, it's kind of a federal system, and others. Know the facts. He asked Jefferson, who was in Paris at this time, to send him more books from Paris about government so he could prepare for this opportunity. Show up early. This is always a good thing to remember if you want to, say, influence some faculty decision. Show up early. He came two weeks before the convention was scheduled to start. Make a lot of friends. Good thing to do. Get some allies. Here's the thing he had in mind. I'm going to have support from the three biggest states, Virginia, along with Massachusetts, and um, Pennsylvania. And then I'm going to build support among three states that think they're going to be big, because everybody thinks they're going to be big. The three southern states that are growing faster than the rest of the Union, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. Here's the deal. If I can get these six states to sign on to the Virginia plan and to hold together, and if, as people sort of expected, Rhode Island doesn't show up, and most people were re relieved to hear that that was true because they thought Rhode Island was full of crazies. If it's six states, they have veto power in this convention. Nothing can get done without them if they hold together. Well, another thing you want to do is have a, get a friendly umpire with some influence. One of the friends that he cultivated was George Washington, a bigger figure than many of the people at the convention, physically and in terms of reputation. Well, that should help. Just a nasty glance like that one from Washington could shut down somebody who was going the wrong way. Diagnose the problem so that people accept your remedy. This is a great, great thing to keep in mind. Framing. In political science, other fields, we like to call it framing. Frame the problem in a way that suggests your solution. You want a stronger national government, right? So who's the cause of all the maladies in the country? The states are. The states are screwing everything up. Parochial state governments were making the country terminally weak, and the Articles of Confederation was too weak to keep them in line. After all, he could say, rightly, that states were setting up tariffs against each other, were profiting from other states, that there were skirmishes between states like Virginia and Pennsylvania over their borders in the western part of Pennsylvania. He could complain that they were thinking about negotiating treaties with Europe on their own that states like Virginia had their own navy. So, in a lot of ways, his argument made sense to the people who came to Philadelphia. Set the agenda. Make sure, is this? No, okay. Make sure that people pay attention to your plan. If you come in with a plan, people are more than likely to discuss your plan and to work through it. Well, that's exactly what happened. The Virginia plan. Look at that Virginia plan closely and think about what it says. We're going to have a strong central government, a government that can impose any kind of tax on anything. Madison privately wrote to Hamilton before Hamilton became Secretary of the Treasury saying, you know, we should uh, work on property taxes at the national level. This government would have broad authority to tax, to regulate commerce, not distinguishing between interstate and 
commerce and commerce within the states, it would regulate all commerce. It would control the military. Those militias would come under the regulations of the national government. Think about this. This national government, and Madison was passionately attached to this idea, would have the power to veto any state law. Any state law. Representation in both houses of Congress would be based on how many people lived in your state. Think about this in connection with his allies. This is the glue that holds this coalition together. In fact, the Virginia plan starts with this. That's intentional. He wants to pass proportional representation, that's what I call it, representation based on population, the more people you have, the more votes you have in both houses of Congress. That would cement those three southern states to the northern states that were big and roll through what he really wanted, which was all of that, all those powers. Well, here's the dilemma. The dilemma, the dilemma you've read about in The Federalist. But he really boils it down in there, and you've got to listen closely to his words. A strong national Republican government created a dilemma. All right, it's bad enough in Virginia or in Connecticut, and we throw up our hands with Rhode Island. But how do you give citizens control? Give them control of the government, because you're supposed to be the ultimate authority. How do we give you control and still make sure that the government makes good laws. How? That's not so easy. How do you let the people govern without letting them mess things up? Or worse, turn to a dictator in frustration? How do we give you power without letting you completely ruin everything? Federal is 51. Think about these words. What is government itself, he wrote? but the greatest of all reflections on human nature. This is a guy who was Jefferson's close friend, Jefferson, the one-man Smithsonian. This was a guy who lived in the Enlightenment, was a student of John Witherspoon. This was a guy who understood all the accomplishments of humans that seemed limitless to many people in the 1780s, in science, in the arts, in writing, in philosophy, in economics. All of those things could stand for human nature at its typical side. But government, not all those arts and sciences and accomplishments, government reflects your nature. We could get angels to govern humans, but that's not going to work. We could hope that all humans are angels, that's futile. In a government of humans, run by humans, clearly we need to depend on the wisdom of the people, on yours, but just as clearly, looking at human nature, we need to depend on, as he put it uh, euphemistically, auxiliary precautions. <laughs> ambition must be made to balance ambition, to counteract ambition. You need to design a government so you can't very easily mess things up. Well, Madison gets the Virginia plan out in the first substantive day of debate at the convention. And from the state of Connecticut walks an old Puritan, Roger Sherman, one of the oldest members of the convention, a guy who himself had helped set up the state of Connecticut before and after the Revolution. Connecticut, by the way, never wrote a new constitution. They just used their old one because in the 1660s, they had gotten a constitution accepted that uh, pretty much let them do what they wanted to do for the most part. We're just going to use that, he said. He wrote all the law books, rewrote the statute books for Connecticut. In 1787, 
He was a reasonably well-known figure in American politics. I'll get to that in a second. But his ambition, after having worked to build Connecticut the way Madison worked to build Virginia, leave lots of power to the states. We're very happy in Connecticut. Thank you very much. We've got our liberty tree. We've got uh, nutmeg. What more could you want? We're going to have ESPN. That's great. All right. Wanted to leave lots of power to the states and just a few more powers to the national government. We can keep the Articles of Confederation and add some stuff. He wanted the states to have equal representation in the legislature because he wanted small states or medium-sized states like Connecticut to have as much influence as the big states to protect the states. He was every bit as shrewd as Madison, though you don't know it because he didn't write as much. He didn't write the Federalist Papers. And he spoke in short sentences, uh, and you had to pay close attention to the politics behind them. He was more experienced, too. How well known was he then? Well, this is a picture you've seen, too. This is the signing of the Declaration of Independence with a committee that wrote the Constitution, or sorry, the Declaration, standing up in the front here. Franklin, Jefferson, Adams, and Roger Sherman. Sherman wrote or signed the Resolves of 1774 that got a lot of this in motion. He signed the Declaration. He signed the Articles of Confederation. It was on the committee that wrote that. And of course, he was at the Constitutional Convention and signed that. Nobody else signed all four of those documents. Much of the Constitution was shaped by the conflict that was so fundamental between these two people. But it wasn't just those two people. It was two visions. The vision of broad national power for the nation's future and narrow national powers to protect the nation's present. A classic battle between present and future. And it played out in issue after issue. Let me name four. Sherman's strategy was pretty clear once you read the documents. Nurture your allies. Madison understood that pretty quickly. Sherman was able to build allies in the smaller states that were going to be excluded from Madison's coalition. His problem was that there were only five of them at any one time. New York was there, but it walked out in a huff, and that left um, New Hampshire to come in a little bit later. So there were five states from which he could build a coalition. Slow down the Virginia plan. One of my pieces of advice to myself, and one of the things I really learned from Sherman is, if you want to slow down somebody's plan that you think is kind of crazy, you say, why do we need to do that? He said that several times. Why do we need to do all this stuff? Why do we need a national veto? We don't have to add that. Explain. Put the other guy on the defensive. Propose an alternative agenda. Sherman slowed down the Virginia plan by saying, we don't need to have uh, a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. We don't need proportional representation in Congress, but I would be willing to compromise. This is another great tactic. Say, okay, I'm opposed to that, but I would be willing to compromise by a proportional House and a Senate that represents the states equally. This is a great tactic. Sound like you're uh, not going to compromise and then offer a compromise. Works great. Propose an alternative agenda. Sherman helped write the New Jersey plan. Change the way a decision is made. This was very good. There was a vote that was deadlocked on whether or not to provide for proportional representation in the Senate. As soon as that was done, somebody called for uh, a committee to work out the details and to find a compromise. 
Sherman agreed with that and emphasized the need to form a committee. Shift the decision-making to another place. And then, Sherman was not added to that committee. His protege was Oliver Ellsworth. But, lo and behold, Ellsworth got sick and recovered as soon as the compromise was written and introduced. What a coincidence. So Sherman had to serve on the committee. Madison did not. This is the committee that recommended what we call the Great Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise on representation in Congress, giving Sherman a body that represented the states, a body like the body in the Articles of Confederation, except now so that the states could more easily make sure that they had representation, there'd be two senators, not one member uh, that had to be there. Political compromises made the Constitution. This is uh, the Constitution Room in Independence Hall. If you go visit in Philadelphia, first was obviously representation. Would Madison and his allies accept this? After all, they had six states behind them, they thought. But increasingly under pressure as time went on, they were worried that uh, individuals would begin to feel the need to compromise, and so they did, breaking up some of Madison's coalition. The delegates finally accepted this compromise, splitting the difference between the House and the Senate, leaving a Senate in which each state gets an equal vote. Let me show you the consequences of this because they affect us now. If you hadn't noticed, California is the size, well, it's bigger than Canada. I think it's about the size of Spain. Maybe a little smaller. It has two senators, two votes. All these states together also have 38 million people. They have 44 votes. Compromise two, slavery. One of the things I was most eager to do was to lay out the slavery debate in one place so that you could hear what these people were saying. Pierce Butler of South Carolina, the state that really wanted to continue to import slaves. The security we want is that our Negroes not be taken from us. And John Rutledge of South Carolina. The people of the Carolinas and Georgia will never be such fools as to give up so important an interest. Religion and humanity have nothing to do with this question. How about Connecticut? Always willing to compromise, Connecticut supported the slave states. Sherman thought it was best to leave the matter the way we find it now. Put it off for a while. Ellsworth. The morality or wisdom of slavery are considerations belonging to the states, the states themselves. What enriches a part enriches the whole. The states are the best judges of their particular interests. Chilling words. These compromises were written into the Constitution, and the resolution of these issues we're still working with now. I can say that because my office is four and a half miles away from Ferguson, Missouri. A slave would be counted as three-fifths of a person for the purpose of apportioning the house. The slave trade was protected until 1808, and slaves who ran away, fugitive slaves, could be returned to the owners, would be returned to their owners. Key compromise three, the presidency. Here's where the institutional balance starts to get more and more complicated. Both Sherman and Madison and everybody else who came to the convention had a simpler plan for the government than the plan that the framers finally sent to the states for ratification. But it got more and more complicated. And the reason is these do aspirations smashed into each other, and they compromised 
by making sure that there was an institution that could stop the institution that they didn't like, that they worried about. Madison, after the Connecticut Compromise, fought for a strong president to battle for the national interest, to battle for the advantage of the country. Sherman fought for a role for the Senate in everything. He wanted the Senate to directly appoint people to the courts, to the bureaucracy. So what did they do? On presidential powers, they created a very complicated set of relationships. The president was potentially a big figure, powerful, somebody who could drive the government forward. But Sherman insisted on making sure that the Senate set constraints on that president. So they created Gulliver. They created a potentially big president tied down by thousands of strings. Remember, it's not the House that approves of nominees to the court, that approves treaties, that approves nominees to the big offices like Secretary of State. It's only the Senate. Key compromise four, federalism. The national government got the tools that a sovereign nation would have to make treaties with other countries, to regulate trade with other countries and between the states, to provide for the national defense, to regulate uh, other activities that were international in scope. But the states would do the hard work of everyday governing. They had already won that in their battles against Britain. The Constitution leaves a very, very vague and ambiguous dividing line between the state's authority and the national authority. In practically every major battle in American politics has taken place over where that boundary is. From slavery in the 19th century to things like abortion and gay rights and gun control today. Yeah, we're fighting these out in the Supreme Court, but watch what the states are doing because they make a huge difference in fact. So what do we inherit? Most Americans seem to think that American government is very screwed up. I don't blame them. Some candidates run on that platform. But it's not just the candidates. The media harps about the problems of American government. And it's hard to deny that in 2012, with the shutdown of government, America's greatest economic weakness wasn't its manufacturing sector or its service sector, it was its government. Political ambition is the engine of American government. Madison said that in, a, in as many words in Federalist 51. It's built for real human nature. Again, the framers wrote a constitution for framers, for politicians to use, a rule book for future politicians. We inherit a government that's much more complicated, much harder to use than any delegate wanted. And as the delegates grew more uncertain about how this Jerry-built government would work, they tried to build in more protections so that their institution could resist the others. They armed their favorite institutions with the will and the ability to stop ambitious politicians elsewhere, the president, the Congress, the courts. And by trying to make the government so hard for their opponents to use, they made it hard for anybody to use. So we have a complicated government designed to force political ambitions to collide. I challenge you, who have not taught Introduction to American Politics, to try to explain how Congress actually does make a law to students in uh, the freshman year of an American politics course. It ain't easy. Ask any leader who has to make all this work, 
try to explain the Electoral College, that's even harder. Here's uh, one leader looking at a marble maze that he, it has to occur to him. This looks like a, a whole lot like the United States Congress. But here's the thing. When we want government to work, man, it snaps into place. December 1941. A surprise attack unites the nation. We've seen that since. And in the New York Times, Tuesday morning, they could report Congress acted without a dissenting vote. Less than three hours after President Roosevelt gave his message, he was signing a declaration of war into law. It had passed Congress that fast. We can act when we want to. U.S. government is easy to use when everybody agrees. It's really hard to use when they're divided and polarized like they are now. It looks more like that. Checks and balances were intentionally designed to make gridlock possible. And son of a gun, they work. Is American government broken? Here's what I think Madison might say today. You know, you need ambition to counteract ambition. If I looked at this government today, Madison might say, it looks like it works pretty good. It looks like it's slow, clumsy, doesn't work very well, and frequently screws up and looks screwed up when we try to figure out what the heck is going on. But that's the way governments, the reflection of human nature, probably ought to work. At least that's the way it looked to people like Madison. So that's what I wanted to say about this. And let me invite questions, because I know students are going to have exciting questions to answer. So what have you got? I've left some Sorry.